what I'd like to do is spend a little bit of time introducing our speaker to you. She has so many accomplishments that I've actually made sure I have my paper in hand. You don't so, have to read them all. Oh, I'm going to, because I think it's pretty impressive. Paula Simons is the, is the Edmonton Journal City columnist, and that's, that's obviously how I know her best. She's a graduate of the University of Alberta and Stanford University, and she's played many roles at the Journal as provincial affairs columnist, arts and culture columnist, as a member of the paper's editorial board. Her work has appeared in a wide variety of community magazines, and she is a semi-regular documentary maker for CBC Radio's Ideas. Before journey, joining the journal, she spent six years as a producer with the CBC Radio in Edmonton and Toronto. What's most impressive is she has earned five national newspaper award citations for her editorials, columns, political reporting. And last year, she was co-winner of the National Newspaper Award for Investigative Journalism for her work on the fatal care investigation into Alberta's child welfare system. She's also received recognition from the Canadian Mental Health Association, the Alberta Centre for Civil Liberties Research, the Canadian Bar Association, and Canada's Governor General for her columns championing social justice, civil rights, and civil society. In 2008, she was honoured by the Edmonton Historical Board for writing on Edmonton history, architecture, and heritage preservation. In 2012, she won an International Epi Award from editor and publisher for best use of social media. And last fall, Paula and the journal team she led won a silver medal at the Canadian Online Publishing Awards for their Yay Quest social media project. I think it's well worth letting everyone know just how accomplished you are. <laughs> Today, we've invited Paula uh, to speak to the uh, Fort Saskatchewan community on the importance of a public library in a digital age. And I'd like you to join me in welcoming you. Thank you so much, Alex. I am fighting a cold, so we're going to hope that uh, I win. Uh, it's a great honor and a pleasure to be here today to have this beautiful drive to Fort Saskatchewan and to see this gorgeous library, which I've not visited before, and how lucky you are to have this place as a community. But I wanted to start today at all good stories from the library should, once upon a time. Once upon a time, in ancient Egypt, Thoth, the god of learning and science, came to the fair to tell him of a wonderful invention he had imagined. Writing. This, said Thoth, will make the Egyptians wiser and give them better memories. But the pharaoh was not impressed. This discovery of yours will create forgetfulness in other souls, he said, because they will not use their memories. They will trust to the external written characters and not remember themselves. What you have discovered, Thoth, is an aim not to memory, but to reminiscence. And you give your disciples not truth, but only the semblance of truth. They will be the hearers of many things and will learn nothing, said the Pharaoh. They will appear to be omniscient and all knowing, and will generally know nothing. They will be tiresome company, having the show of wisdom without the reality. The Pharaoh, you see, is how we would call an uh, early adopter of new technology. I'm pretty sure you've ever heard that story before. The argument will sound familiar. It's the same argument we hear all around us about the way children learn today. If we give them calculators, they won't learn their times tables. If we give them Google and Wikipedia and smartphones, they'll never bother to learn or memorize anything because they'll always be able to look it up. It will be tiresome company having the show of wisdom without the reality. All time. The story of Thoth and his doubting pharaoh come to us from the work of Plato, who includes this story in the Phaedrus, one of his Socratic dialogues. Plato's narrator and main character is his own teacher, Socrates, who distrusted the written word and wanted to teach all of his students one on one. But Plato, who had his own ethical thoughts about the arts of writing, nonetheless wrote down Socrates' teachings. And that's why, so ironically, thousands of years later, you and I are able to share and read Socrates' story of Thoth and the Pharaoh. Was Socrates wrong about writing? To us in 2015, it certainly seems so. 
the written word is all around us and not just here in this library. We wake up in the morning to the words on our shampoo bottles and our cereal boxes. We read our newspapers, at least I hope you do, whether we pick up a print version or check our mobile app. We head out to work or to school or to run our family errands, passing Tim Horton signs and stop signs and these days election campaign signs wherever we go. Text is everywhere. We read for information, we read for entertainment, we read to communicate with the people we love. And think of the simple miracle of the written word. Today, this afternoon, I'm looking right at you. I'm talking to you. You are hearing me. But this morning, if you picked up your newspaper, I was talking to you then, too. I was 40 kilometers away, and I was at your breakfast table in Fort Saskatchewan. My words were not just on the page or the screen in front of you. They were in your brains. The abstract symbols I typed in my laptop two days ago were transformed into ideas, into silent sounds that penetrated your consciousness. You weren't just reading my letters and my words, you were reading my mind. It's the most intimate act of all reading. I put my thoughts right into your brain. That was thoughts magic. And yet, some things have a point. Every time we make a leap forward in communications technology, we sacrifice something pure, something rarefied, for what we gain. All kinds of technological changes have made information more accessible and democratic, started with writing itself. When clay tablets gave way to papyrus, and then to parchment, and then to paper. When monks worked through medieval scriptoriums, were put up and work by Gutenberg's printing presses. When printing technology improved enough to make books cheap and literacy universal. When the telegram and the telephone connected people around the world. Each time we make a technological leap, we democratize knowledge and strike down established elites. We put information into the hands of more and more people, empowering them while we trip the existing command and control structures. And every time we make a major technological leap and disrupt the old order, we inspire a new creative kind of art form. Without film cameras, there would be no movies. Without televisions, there would be no television shows. And without cheap paper and cheap printing presses, there would be no books. But of course, every time we knock down existing power elites, we also upset existing and trusted authorities. When we give more knowledge and power of information to the masses, but we also give it to the idiots and the trolls. And when we dethrone and defrock the gods and the priests, the pharaohs and the philosophers, we often lose the kind of sophistication and subtle, verified knowledge and artistry that went with them. Mass-produced books like the kinds we see here all around us are far more accessible and useful than handwritten, gold-filtered, illuminated manuscripts on parchment. But they're not really as pretty. And when information flows free, and there aren't information priests as intermediaries, well then, who do we believe? Where do we turn for information we can trust? And that, of course, is the challenge facing all libraries in the digital age. The modern public library, like this one, began in a time and in a society when few ordinary people could afford to buy books. Hardcover books, printed on fine paper, were expensive and out of the reach of most working class people. Even people who were comfortably off could hardly afford all the books they wanted to read. And so libraries, allowed communities to pool their resources to buy and store books for everyone to share. The public library allowed ordinary people access to the kinds of books, the kinds of information power that had only belonged to the privileged, the aristocrats, to the scholars, and to the rich before. Public libraries are radical engines of social disruption. You're part of that revolution as you sit here. Public librarians had two primary tasks, which often came into conflict. One was to lend out the books to as many people as possible, to encourage and spread a love of reading and knowledge. The other, of course, was to organize and safeguard the books, to protect them, and to keep them properly shared. This is, of course, why passionate, greedy readers like me have such a love-hate relationship with libraries and librarians. You librarians, you always want the books back. <laughs> but these days, librarians and libraries face a new challenge. Books, good solid hardcover books, still aren't cheap. It's not unusual to pay $30 or $40 for a premium hardcover. And beautiful children's picture books are at least $20, $25 a pop. 
which is a lot if you're taught that you're smearing them with peanut butter. Oh, I was so happy to find out who picture books in a way. But online, books are available for a pittance. And if they're in the public domain, you can download them for nothing at all. Books, movies, music, all the things that libraries offered 10 or 15 years ago. These days, we command them at our phones and at our fingertips, on our laptops and tablets, our Kindles and Kobos. And the librarian, as a guardian and gatekeeper of knowledge, has also been dethroned. When I was a kid, one of my favorite places in all the world was the old Jasper Place Public Library in West Edmonton, where I scavenged through the shelves like a marauding, ravening book beast. Some librarians were marvelous, putting up with me, recommending odd books that became beloved favorites. And I'll forever owe a to the librarian who first recommended I read The Phantom Toll or The Wolves of Willoughby Chase. But other librarians, not like the ones here, I'm sure, were gorgons who censored my precocious reading, wicked witches who refused to let me into the adult section, or who only allowed me to take out five books a week as if five books a week were enough for anyone. Their kind still walk the earth. When my daughter was small, the librarian at her elementary school only let them take out one fiction and one non-fiction book a week. And you weren't allowed to take out a novel unless you also took out an improving work of non-fiction. And if you weren't, you weren't allowed to take out a work of non-fiction unless you also took out a novel. It turned reading from a joy into a chore which is not a great idea to encourage elementary school age children to read. But these days, librarians often lose their chances to function as advisors and as gatekeepers when children and adults can download whatever they want without stepping foot in the door when the reference desk has been replaced by Google. So in our digital world, our librarians, and journalists for that matter, as doomed as Socrates and the monks in the scriptorium, do public libraries still have a role? Let me answer both those questions together. Yes, the role of the library, especially the community library, is still an absolutely vital one, and not just because they're full of computer terminals, thank you. In the first place, let's not underestimate the value of a local public library as a community gathering space, and especially at this latitude. Twelve months a year, the library is a place where stay-at-home moms and toddlers come for picture books and a moment of quiet sanity. It's a place where seniors come for company and for intellectual stimulation. It's a place where school kids and teenagers come, not just for homework help, but for outreach programs and writing workshops. A place where librarians, information ninjas, can show them that there is more to online research than Wikipedia, thank God. And it's a place where people who are newcomers to this country, who are learning English, can come for the rich repository of the resources that they need. In many communities, certainly in Edmonton, the library is also a place where the poor and the lonely can come for warmth and for solace and to feel part of a larger community from which they are often largely excluded. And yet, there is a danger that the library can become to be seen too much as just a place to hang out. I don't know if any of you here ever saw the sly indie science fiction film Robot and Frank, starring Frank Langella and Susan Sarandon which came out in 2012. In that film, Susan Sarandon plays the librarian in a town about the size of Fort Saskatchewan. A rich young hipster moves to town and decides to adopt the local library as his philanthropic project. Except he wants to get rid of all those musty, dust-catching books. The better to provide people with what he pompously calls an augmented reality library experience. In effect, he wants to make the library into an artifact a period piece, a hipster clubhouse where the few remaining analog books are sets and prop decorations. And that is the trap that our libraries and our bookstores, in fact, must avoid. Because I am not ready to let books become like illuminated manuscripts or lay tablets. Sure, it's great to be able to Google and download and swipe, but nothing can quite compete with the magic of wandering through the library stacks, the joy of serendipity of coming across books that you weren't looking for, but tumbled to accidentally instead. It is great defense of the free press, Eric Virginica, the poet and philosopher John Milton, extols the benefit of books promiscuously read, as he puts it. And that's the glorious opportunity that a good library offers, the chance to dive in and book swap, instead of committing to a lifelong relationship. 
Each library is an eclectic and unique collection, a reflection of its various curators' own interests and passions. You never know what you will find, and often you will find odd, obscure, half-forgotten things that you never think to access via your eye gadget. A good local library doesn't just bring in the latest bestsellers and blockbusters, the newest magazines. It acts as a community member and archive, and a time machine that lets new generations rediscover the great reads and stories of the past, or lets older readers revisit their youth. And never underestimate the power of the book as a piece of technology. It's portable. It's green and renewable. It's malleable. You never need to plug it in or change its batteries. You can read it in the tub. Not that I would ever read library books in the tub, but one could. And the joy of reading a book in an act of quiet communion, powered by imagination and empathy, is one that cannot be replaced. A few years ago, I went to read to a grade two class at Bromwell School in the Abbotsfield neighborhood of North East Edmonton, not so very far from here. It's one of the poorest parts of Edmonton. And just as I was leaving, I came across a box of little children's paperback books in our marketing department, left over from some failed promotion. And I picked up enough books for every kid in the class. I was very gendered, I'm afraid. It was Madeline for all the girls and Berenstein Bears for all the boys. To the kids, I read one of Bridget Kipling's Just So stories. And then I gave each child a book. The visit seemed to go very well. So I was surprised when the teacher called me exactly a week later in tears. It seemed that each of the kids, a week after my visit, had brought their books back and turned them in. The children had assumed that they had to bring the books back when they did to the library. And the teacher told me that not one of those students, not one, had ever had a book of his or her own before. She was calling me to thank me for making such a difference in their lives. And I was embarrassed because I'd really only grabbed the books on my own. I was stunned. It hadn't occurred to me that my little gift, which had cost me literally nothing, would have that kind of impact. And I was both humbled and horrified to think about kids living in my own prosperous city who had never owned a book of their own before. These weren't kids with iPads and laptops. They were kids downloading books on Kindle. They were kids for whom a simple paperback picture book was a precious treasure. I returned to Rumble School a year or two later and spoke with the principal. She told me that they often had kids arrive for kindergarten who had never seen or held a book. Kids who literally did not know how the book as a piece of technology worked. I never forget my time at Rumble School. No experience in my life as a journalist or a parent has ever made me appreciate the value of books and of libraries and repositories more. So yes, let our libraries today be welcoming community hubs where people can access the internet and learn the best Google searching strategies. Let them be places that teach everyone, from children to seniors, how to extract the best from all our new information technologies. Let them be places that reach out and connect the world on social media. But let us be sure to entrench at the heart of our library experience the magic of books, the magic of writing, the joy of the imagination, and the great gift of the great God God. And let us honor, too, the role of the library, not just as guardian and gatekeeper, but as God. Thank you very much.